Well, good morning, and good morning to those that are watching via live stream. We miss you, and uh, we're thankful that you're there as well, and that we can get together as this. It's a day to be grateful for those that gave their life, as has already been prayed about and spoken of, and I know that you were there as well in that gratitude and we are most grateful, though, as well, because of those freedoms that we have the Word of God that we can be into together and study what God has to tell us. And we are in a section here that has nothing to do with Memorial Day, but it has to do with God's Word, and it has to do with our interactions with one another, which are very important because we have interactions with God, and then we have interactions with with one another. I want to mention to you that, and just encourage you please, to keep praying for Josh Bryant, my son, and Jan's son, that uh, he is in the hospital in Houston and continues there. He has some very difficult times at times. Allison was with him for three days this past week, but the, lo the hospital is still locked down and no one can be with him. And for a person that is completely paralyzed, it's a very difficult situation. And one of my prayers, and I pray would be your prayer, because I think prayer has sustained him thus far, is that you would also pray that God gives him the peace of God that passes understanding as he's laying there and observing all these things that are going on around him that are happening to him, and that his trust would be in God, and that God would yet raise him up because that's what we want to see, to the glory of his son. Now, we are, in, we are engaged in, a, in the study of the Sermon of the Mount, and the passage that we're in, at least in part, has to do with that which was just read. And I would remind you that last time we, were, we reviewed very quickly for chapter 7, verse 1 and 2, our audience, our purpose, and our context, which is so important to understand what's going on. First of all, the audience that Christ was preaching to were the masses that were believing in Jehovah, but were taught and misled by terrible religious leaders. A lot of that going on today as well, isn't it? And Christ's purpose, therefore, was to correct the fundamental understanding that they had in relation to salvation. He's correcting it. And so with that, we have what salvation is presented by Christ and what it is not. And we have to be reminded that this entirety of chapter 7 is that salvation is of the Lord and it is supernatural. It is something that brings a change in a person's life. It is different than mere reform or gritting our teeth and trying to be religious. It is a work of God that transforms from within. And last time we looked at these first, uh, first two verses and we said that he said here, do not judge so that you will not be judged. Do not judge. This is one of the do nots. Again, he's showing us what salvation is and what it is not. And so he has these do nots and then he has these do's. This do not is in the context with the other do nots, all having reference back to the false or poor or twisted teaching of the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious hypocrites. And he's saying in chapter 7, verse 1, do not judge like them. It's not that we don't judge, that we don't make assessments. We are to be wise. But he is saying, don't judge like the Pharisees judged. Their judgment was self-righteous contempt, prejudiced by misuse of Scripture. And it was by this, may I say, that they also misjudged the Lord Jesus Christ. They were the progenitors of causing Him to be hung on a cross because they didn't recognize Him and they hated Him without a cause. So, 
The Lord Jesus says in the, elsewhere, in fact in John 7, 24, that do not judge according to appearance. Only what we see which is limited in our own eyes, but judge, he says, with righteous judgment. Now that's what God's people are called upon to do, and we'll see that as we're studying this together. Judge, in other words, as God judges. That's what we want to do. That's why we take in the mind of God's precious Word. So, this judgment we're dealing with is not a judgment or a command to forego opinions, to stop our discretion, our judgment about any decision in life, but instead we are to make righteous, Christ-like decisions about everything we do. He is our Lord. He is our Master. And this is His Word, which tells us the very mind of God Himself. Amen? Okay, with that little miniature introduction, let me ask the Lord again to help us as we study together, please. Father, we're so grateful to be in Your Word. And we recognize that we're needful, each one of us, to have Your Word permeate our lives and our hearts and our minds and to change us. So we ask You, Father, that You would help us and instruct us by Your Holy Spirit and guide and direct my lips, my words, what I say, and what we hear and understand from Your Word, Father, that we would be more like You. We praise You that You are the God who sets all things in justice and righteousness and truth, and it is all encompassed by Your wonderful love. We praise You this morning and ask You to help us and guide us, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Now, I have confession here that I have been guilty of this probably multiple times, and I suspect that every adult in this room who follows Christ has at some time or other said after they've heard good preaching, I hope it's good preaching or preaching, that, you know, if only so-and-so had been here to hear that, right? Now, it may be, and I hope that is the case, that we had the best of intentions when we said that. That is, we want others to hear truth and know Christ and to walk with Him. But on the other hand, I think sometimes we have allowed ulterior motives to slip in where we are caught thinking others need more enlightenment to be more knowledgeable like we are, all right? A little bit of pride or arrogance or self-righteousness comes in there sometimes and slips in. Sort of a pharisaical attitude that we've arrived. But those other people, they still need some serious help. Now this undoubtedly on a larger scale was the attitude of the scribes and Pharisees thinking they are more spiritual, and we looked at that in the previous session together. But they really had a contempt for anyone and everyone else. So to judge critically as the Pharisees is very dangerous. That's what Christ is speaking of. Because none of us have arrived, and none of us are the standard. We don't know everything, by the way. And so not only do we put ourselves when we do that in the place of God, but we manifest an inflated view of ourselves. And the Pharisees are exhibit A in this instruction that Christ is given. When we as they have a wrong view of ourselves, which is what they had, we show we also have a wrong view of God, don't we? And may I also say, if we have a wrong view of ourselves and a wrong view of God, then we also cannot help but have a wrong view of others. 
Make sense? This mindset of weak perception affects all judgments and all reasonings. Christ exposes this perverted thinking and so forth in beginning in verse 3, where I have titled this, We Need to See Yourself, See Ourselves, whatever. We need to see. We need to look at ourselves. So here we have righteous sarcasm at its highest, and I really believe that. Look at verse 3. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? It is like getting something small, and we've all had that, stuck in our eye like a grain of dust, but the idea is that it is something that slightly troubles the eye and maybe slightly messes up our vision for a time, but only preventing us from having more perfect vision. But he also says here about a, notice the log that is in your own eye, or it's other, otherwise translated beam, and I think that is actually more accurate. By contrast is this large piece of squared lumber. <laughs> if, if you can just envision this almost like a cartoon, completely uh, in, stuck in the eye and protruding out of the eye, uh, you know, it, it is, it's, this is an amazing sarcasm by the Lord Jesus. And what he is showing here is the ridiculousness of these that were judging in this manner. This is, using your imagination, a very troubling picture. The, vi the vision that such a person would have with this beam coming out of their eye is an impossible way to see. You can't see with a beam in your way and protruding out of your eye and preventing any kind of vision. It's, it's entirely blocked. Now, people are naturally quicker and more sensitive to judge the small offenses that we perceive or think we perceive in others than the greater offenses that are in ourselves. Isn't this exactly what goes on with all this pecking in the news and everything, even on political things and all kinds of other things? It's peck, 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 you know, and then peck, peck, and it's just going on. It's just the national pastime, you know. We cut down others and yeah, talk about, oh, that guy over there, he's terrible. Let me see what he did, what he said, man. And it just goes on and on and on and on. Well, that meanders, of course, that same attitude comes into the church of the living God. And this is why the Bible speaks so much to us about humility. Humility. Do you remember Isaiah, for example? Well, if we look at the verse, and I'm not getting you to turn there, but Isaiah 66, 2 says, To this one I will look, God says, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. Or if we think in terms of Isaiah 6, where Isaiah saw the Lord in that vision high and lifted up and, and, the, and the cherubim were over him crying out, holy, holy, holy. And Isaiah looked at that and what was his response? Woe is me. And he wasn't just saying, Woe is me in that sense. He meant it from the depths of his heart. He says, I'm undone. I live in the midst of people who are undone. For mine eyes have seen the glory of God. He had to be made humble as great as he was, as the great prophet Isaiah, for God to use him. And in that same context, what did God do? He said, you know, who's going to go for me? Who's going to go? And after he had been humbled, after those tongs had touched his tongue and changed him, and changed him from the inside so that he wasn't just critical of everybody else, he recognized that we're all wretched and sinful. 
He said, here am I, Lord. Here am I. Send me. I want you to turn to James chapter 1. A little book of James after Hebrews. James chapter 1, and we have a parallel passage here with what the Lord Jesus is saying. And uh, he's talking here about what we, who we really are, about what we do and so forth. In James 1.23, he says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. Now, you know that elsewhere, in fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, we have Paul using the example of, of the Word of God is like a mirror. And as we keep looking into the Word of God, we, we and keep looking and keep looking and keep looking, that image that, that we see of ourselves becomes more Christ-like. The more we're in the Word of God reflecting that image. But here he's doing something of the same thing because what does a mirror do? If we look in the mirror, you know, the mirror doesn't tell any lies. I, I wish it did. I look in there and I say, who's that old man I'm looking at? That old man I'm looking at is me. And if I have a, a ketchup stain on my collar, it's going to show that to me. Or if I've got hairs out of place or, or, or whatever, wrinkles and things that are there, and I, oh, man, gray hairs, whatever, it, it's going to tell me the truth, isn't it? Now, James says this is like a person looking into the mirror, and we look into the Word of God, and then he walks away and he forgets who he really is. It, it doesn't, he hasn't changed his opinion of himself. If you look in this same passage in, in James in verse 25, he says, but one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides in it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. And then down in verse 26, he says, if you don't do that, this man's religion is worthless. It's worthless. If we don't understand who we are ourselves as sinners and all we're doing is focusing on other people and looking at all of their faults and setting ourselves up as their judge, we've forgotten what we look like too, haven't we? Because we're all sinners in need of, of a Savior. That's where we are. Because that mirror tells the truth and that Word of God tells the truth. Nothing can change us but the Word of God applied by the Spirit of God. And so, getting back to our text in chapter 7 and verse 4, he says, or can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye. Now this sarcasm and craziness of this, which is for illustration purposes by our precious Lord, is showing that this person hypocritically has gone so far as to put into practice, say to your brother, Take the, again, the illogic of this physical picture. This guy standing with a beam protruding from his eye and telling his brother, and they both claim faith, that's why the brother term is used, you need to get that speck out of your eye, you know? <laughs> uh, yet is unconcerned about the beam in his own eye. Now, the, the Lord is using this as a, as a means to communicate the terrible ridiculousness of those of us and how we can often interact with one another and not realize it. Uh, the meaning behind this, of course, is not really about specks and, and eyes and beams uh, in eyes. 
it's about seeing ourselves spiritually as we really are. Seeing ourselves as God sees us, not as we imagine, and not being fixed on everyone else's faults, which are there, but neglecting our own. And let me look at another related passage with you. Would you go over to Romans chapter 14, and may I just remind you, after all the theology that Romans begins with through the first eight chapters, that he, there's, a, there's a turn, and when we get, uh, he's dealing with the, the practice of, of our Christianity, beginning in chapter 12. And when we get to chapter 14, he's dealing with these non-essential matters that people in Christ have a tendency to nitpick one another about. And this judging business goes on here. Look at verse 4. We're just kind of jumping in. And this is very similar to what Christ is saying in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. In other words, he's saying here that who are you? judging others on non-essential matters, and he puts it into the context of servants, or really get right down to it, slaves. Slaves. That's what they were, bond slaves. Bond slaves are slaves. Bond slaves are love slaves. But slaves are those that were, content, were absolutely committed only to one person, their master. They weren't, it, it wasn't their business to be dealing with everyone else. And you see, the, the context here is the same for us as Christian brethren. God is our master. Christ is our master. It, it's not our business, in that sense, to be judging everyone else. And that's what Paul will go on to say here. He says, To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. The issue is what God thinks about you and me and all the other servants of, of the true and the living God because that's what we are. And, uh, and it's very important to recognize this. And notice the thoroughness and perfection of God's judgment. He says, one person, uh, excuse me, to his own master stands or falls, or will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. And we get down to verse 5. One person regards one day above another, and another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. And he says, He who observes the day observes it for the Lord, and he who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat, he gives thanks to God. For no one of us lives for himself, and no one dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. Our concern is always what God is doing in reference to us and our responsibility and commitment to Him. Where I wanted to get you to turn is 1 Corinthians. Let me go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 also deals with this same issue. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, this rowdy uh, church, and look at verse 5. Notice what Paul says here. They were judging him, prejudging Paul. And, you know, they were the group that were saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Jesus, and so forth. And he says, therefore, in verse 5, Five, therefore do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes who will bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts, and then each man's praise will come to him from God. Now, if you just take this fellow with the beam in his eye that can't even see, the cartoonish kind of thinking with that, but for illustration. But notice, by contrast, the thoroughness of what it says 
about the Lord and His judgment. He says He's going to bring to light the things hidden in the darkness. There's no darkness with God. There's no darkness with Jesus Christ. Everything will be seen the way it should be seen. And He says the things that are hidden, everything necessary for judgment will be included. You see, how what a contrast this is with the judgment of the man with a beam in his eye and the judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ who is the omniscient, holy, living God who knows everything about everyone and about everything that's even a possibility about everything. And he even says here, who will disclose the motives of men's hearts. Even the reason things are being done will be judged. But it can only be judged by the living God because you and I don't know the motives of men's hearts. We've got a beam in our eye. We are in darkness. We are finite in that sense. None of the abilities that are spoken of here are things that we naturally have. And it should bring the Christian great comfort at the same time mixed with righteous fear that God will clear up all these inequities. Right? God's going to settle all the books. And, and our concern needs to be what? What he thinks. Not what everybody else thinks. Now don't get me wrong, I, I, I don't want you to think ill of me. Or, and you don't want other people to think ill of you and all those kinds of things. But ultimately, my main concern is what does Christ think about me? Because there's not anything hidden from Him. So when we go back to our context here, what does Christ do? He calls these ones hypocrites. Look at verse 5. You, you hypocrite. Now, you know what a hypocrite is. Um, that's a person that wears a mask. They had in the... Th you're, all of you are hypocrites today. No, I'm just kidding. Not for COVID-19, all right? A hypocrite is somebody in a play. They're play acting. And behind that mask, there could be the ugliest of faces while on the mask shows them to be smiling or happy or whatever. That's the way they did in that Greek theater. But he's saying, you hypocrite. That's, you're wearing this mask. And behind it, it's like the Pharisees were spoken of as whitewashed sepulchers, but inside were full of dead men's bones. The falseness of hypocrisy gains Nothing does it. Their judgment was terrible. And why? He says, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. What are they to do? And what are we to do? We are to first get our own selves, get our own house together. First is protos, which means chief or primary, not just in order, but our primary responsibility is to deal with our own selves before God before we get into the business of trying to deal with what other people are doing. The falseness of hypocrisy always leads people in these kinds of directions because... There's a lack of humility and a lack of wisdom that God Himself provides when we look at His Word. Now this is the word, this first here, that is used, if you look back at, uh, across the page maybe, at, at uh, Matthew 6.33, where He says, Seek first. His kingdom and His righteousness. That's what we are to do. Instead of worrying about things, we are to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. That means foremost. Way above every other issue is our personal relation to God. And to get right with God ourselves 
through the means He has provided His Son, repentance, faith, and obedience, we can't accomplish anything of any value until that is correct with us. Just being religious, just having self-made standards and rules and all of that kind of thing won't cut it, will it? If there's hypocrisy, if there's not truth, if there's not the work of God that has gone on. I want you to see an Old Testament example of this. Go back to Psalm 51, if you would, please. Remember how David, who was a man after God's own heart, and yet he was a sinner, wasn't he? A great sinner. Because he sinned with Bathsheba. And then even from that committed murder of Uriah. But here we have in Psalm 51 his confession and his getting right with God. Nathan came to him, you recall, and said, you're the man and so forth. And, and we have this, all oh, this wonderful psalm here that can be applied in our own lives in so many ways. But look at, at verse 10. David's plea, and this is from the bottom of his heart, creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. What's he doing? He's focusing on himself. He has to get, he's not looking at, well, how about old so-and-so over there? Well, how about those people over there? Oh, well, how about such and such over here? No, he's focusing who? On himself, isn't he? Getting right with God. My responsibility is to get right with God. He says, don't cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Now, I want you to notice something. Look at verse 13. Then, and a then has been added by the translators, but I think correctly so. He says, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. Now, when, where is that then therefore? That then is there because until David himself gets right with God, gets the beam out of his own eye, he can't help anybody else in finding the Lord Jesus. That's the point. And until I am squared away, spiritually myself, how can I square someone else away? Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you, and not until then. So to begin to judge the imperfections of others, what we must be free of these obstructions ourselves. Then and only then, in any sense, can we be qualified to spiritually assess someone else and make a proper allowance for our own imperfection, which by the way in this life, we'll never completely get the beam out of our eye. It won't happen in this life, but hope, hopefully we're getting down to the specs somewhere there is what we're trying to do at least. Now back in our text, look then at verse 6. We have a little turn here, and this is a different paragraph, just a one sentence paragraph or one verse paragraph. He says, do not give what is holy to dogs and do not throw your pearls before swine or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Now we're still talking here about judgment, aren't we? Now remember, he started with do not judge. And now all of a sudden, wait a minute, he's telling us to judge, isn't he? You can't not give what is holy to dogs and swine if you haven't made a judgment. And I think this is a command of God, and I think that, that uh, it is here to be a balancer. That we would not misinterpret what Christ is saying here. That we would make wise assessments of every situation, and by the way, every person is something that we're called upon to do. Not to be critical, but to be wise. Now this is one of the most powerfully worded pictures also in Scripture. It speaks of the condition of man, his natural hatred of the light. Here given in the terms of swine 
and dogs. And it is really even, we could go back to the beginning in Genesis and Cain and Abel and we can see that kind of friction that existed between them. Cain was the swine and the dog and Abel tried to present his pearls before that swine and he tore him to pieces. Now all men are born depraved. But that doesn't mean that we're all men, or all men are as bad as they could be, but that some have deeper and greater expression of that depraved condition than others do. And please understand that dogs here are not house pets, <laughs> like your little muffin or whatever. We're here talking about ravenous, wild animals that that roamed in packs and were very, very dangerous animals. And swine are the unclean animals of the covenant that the Hebrews, to be obedient to God, were not to be, have anything to do with. So the pearls here are the truths of salvation and righteousness that is related to God with all of the, the pieces of that, of love and faith and obedience and all of that. And Christ is saying, you must make an, an assessment of those that you and I encounter, just as you would not take your life savings, I hope you wouldn't, and walk out here on the street and, and find the first old guy walking by and say, here, would you hold on to this and keep it safe for me? We have to make assessments in life and everything that we do. And the greatest blessing you have, the pearl here, is your truth that God has given you in your relationship to Jesus Christ. That's the pearl of great price. That's the pearl, the beautiful, most exquisite possession that you have. And, and so this passage alone, all, uh, uh, along with its placement, makes it clear Christ was not blanket saying in chapter 7 verse 1, do not judge, but was dealing with the critical judgment of the scribes and the Pharisees that we are not to self-righteously judge others with contempt as they were. And every person that comes across our path is different. And the, there are those that we know, just as the Pharisees and the scribes, hated the truth. They hated it. That's why they hated Christ. And that's why they hate, and that goes on today, doesn't it? That's why they, there's such hatred for Christians. And there was a time when Christ Himself shut off all communication effort with the scribes and the Pharisees. You remember, we won't go there, but in Matthew 12, they accused the Lord Jesus of, of doing the miracles that He did by the power of Beelzebul, or in other words, Satan. And as a result, when we get to Matthew 13, he spoke to them in parables so that they would purposely not understand. He knew they were like ravenous dogs. Won't get you to turn there either, but you know in John chapter 2 and verse 24 and 25, Christ was speaking to the multitudes there. But it says he was not entrusting himself to any man. Why? Because it goes on to say he knew what was in man. I think one of the most, I will get you to turn there. It's just a few pages over. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. This is instruction that Christ is giving to his disciples. What does he say here? Behold, and that means pay attention. Special attention. I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. 
Going out as a Christian, a true Christian, we're talking about here, is not an easy thing. He says, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. It's dangerous. And so he says, so be shrewd as serpents. Serpents were known as being very cunning and crafty. And that's the idea here. And innocent as doves. If you're going to have a fight with a dove, you're going to win. <laughs> doves are very gentle. And so he's using here some pictures for us. But he's telling these disciples to have wisdom, to make assessment, to, to make judgments, to have understanding of the fallen world in which you live. And this is a very important warning here from the Lord Jesus Himself. He says, as you represent Me in this world, here is what to expect. Go with me to 2 Timothy. And this is, of course, a pastoral epistle. 2 Timothy in chapter 3 where Paul gives really uh, uh, this terrible, terrible picture of what people are like in their depravity and the condition they find themselves in the latter days. And he, I'll just jumping into the middle here, as he's describing these, also included in this description though, in verse 5, it says, is holding to a form of godliness. The idea here is they're religious. Although it says they have denied its power, right? And so here are people that have all of the darkness, of the wickedness, of evil being portrayed, and yet at the same time, there is a claim in them of something, we would say, of Christianity. But what does Paul here tell them to do? Avoid such men as these. Now that's the same concept of don't cast your pearls before swine. The same concept altogether. And he warns them also is down in verse 7 where he says they're always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They're not able. And that's one of the reasons you don't cast your pearls out there, expecting something to return on that. In the same way that when Christ was dealing with the scribes and the Pharisees, they had no appreciation, no love for, no turning to the truth whatsoever. It was pure D, 100% rejection. That's what he's saying here. They're always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And those are really two different things. Two different things. And he says down in verse 8, what's their real problem? But the last part of verse 8, he says, rejected in regard to the faith. God has rejected them. And because God has rejected them, we too need to be leery, and that's what these warnings are about. Now, it would be great if those opposing the truth would simply go on their way. But that is not reality. And, and Christ is, is telling us uh, here in our text of Matthew 7, and as He was telling them at that time, that this whole business of the intensity of evil is a relentless energy that is destructive and poisonous and that you need to be weary, wary of this. Now, you're weary of it too, but you need to be wary of it. As we take in the Word of God, we are to have the mind of Christ that can begin to deal with this kind of opposition in the world because that's where we all live. Now, 
I hope as you have insight in God's Word that when you're listening to preachers on TV or the radio or and there's some good ones out there but there's also some real hucksters there's so much that goes on not just in the Christian uh, communication world certainly there but in all the, the realm of politics and everything else there is so many lies built on raw hatred of the truth and it goes on at every level are you aware of that I certainly hope you are and so we must all make important assessments and we must all judge continually just as our Lord judged who was silent before Pilate because he wasn't going to cast his pearls before swine he knew Pilate's heart and we need to know people's heart by being in this word in fact I want to close with Matthew excuse me with Romans 12 going back to Romans again look carefully at what it says in Romans 12 again after all the theology we have the practice of living in Christ Jesus here and he tells us in Romans 12, 1 and 2, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. We're to give ourselves entirely to Him. He is our Master and Lord. And then notice he says, And do not be conformed to this world. Now, the Pharisees and the scribes were conformed to the world. They were full of bitterness and pride and contempt for everyone else and in the name of religion were trying to build themselves up. But he says, don't be conformed to this world, but notice, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. You see what that's saying? That's assessment. And we can't have assessment unless we are being more and more being transformed in the Word of God and taking it in and it's changing us and by it changing us, by it renewing our mind, we know the will of God and we're able to make decisions that are good and acceptable and mature. Perfect there is mature. So what we need is not so much to have a critical self-directed mindset of self-made standards, but instead a transforming of our own minds, taking in that which is of God, that we will be equipped to judge righteously. And so even look at chapter 12 of Romans and verse 3. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. That's the very context of Matthew chapter 7, isn't it? When we're judging others, we are thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, judging in the sense of contempt critically that he was talking about in the same manner as the scribes and the Pharisees. And notice what he goes on to say. But to think so as to have what? Sound judgment. There it is. That's a fun, isn't it wonderful? We're, we've made full circle. But to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. Saying the same thing. That our Lord Jesus Christ was saying in Matthew chapter 7. Brethren, what do we need? We need the transforming work of God. If you're in Christ Jesus, you've come through by justification to Him with nothing in your hand. You're a new creature in Christ. You're born again. 
you're in the sanctification process and we're struggling in that and we're moving in that into a position and a place of continually growing in Christ to become more like Him until we exit this life into glorification. Hallelujah. And so part of that whole business is to thinking, is to think like Him. Is to think like Him. Now, we normally have at this time the Lord's table. And because of the health issues and concerns, we decided not to do that. But may I just remind you, we have a Savior. And everything is all about Him. Christ is all in all. He's our Lord. He's our Master. He gave Himself on behalf of sinners that we might have the righteousness of Christ in Him. And so as we go forth from this place, and we live our lives, and that's what we're talking about even in the context of this today. It's all about Christ, isn't it? We're nothing without Him. We need Him. Cling to Him this week. And be appreciative of that He gave His blood and He gave His body that we might have life. And even in the things of life, that we might have a we might have judgment, that we might have assessment, because we have truth here. We have light beaming forth from this precious word that helps us to live in a difficult world in which we are called to live until he takes us home. So God be with you. And each and every day, your heart of gratitude goes out to Christ and to Christ alone. Let's bow in prayer, please. Father, we thank you that you left us here to be lights in a darkened world, but we must be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We must know how to interface in a world that is filled with hatred of you. Oh, give us the wisdom that we need, dear Lord, and not to pick at one another. Oh, but to find our peace with you and even work towards the goal of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, that we might be sanctified and holy and pursue holiness without which no man will see the Lord. Please bless everyone here. Guide us, O great Father, in thy truth. We praise you for how you have left us with all of this which tells us of you that we might know you truly. Bless everyone here and in the sound of my voice to the praise and honor and glory of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.